physics also heavily utilizes computer science, whether for analyzing data or operating telescopes to guide us towards the next frontiers in space. There is so much left to discover of our universe. Here to shed light upon dark matter, one of today's most thrilling scientific topics, please welcome Junior Amanda Smith. Hello everyone. I invite you to spend the next 10 minutes with me examining a form of energy that was not even considered until three decades ago, but is now thought to account for 70% of the mass energy density of the universe. But before we dive into that, I'll tell you now, I didn't wake up this morning ready to give a talk about dark energy because it was the nerdiest thing I could think of, but rather because a curiosity that was awakened in seventh grade science class has now evolved into a passion. And the summer after seventh grade, my favorite teacher, Mr. Trudell, generously loaned me Tiny Timmy, his small refractor telescope, and a handful of physics textbooks. I pored over them, annotating every page, and deciding then that I needed to study astrophysics in the future. In the summer after ninth grade, my parents supported and encouraged me attending a three-week intensive summer seminar in cosmology. It was in this course that I affirmed my enthusiasm for astrophysics and learned about dark energy for the first time. During this course and in the years following, I've done my own research through reading academic journals, online material, and books to try to cultivate an understanding of this phenomenon. And today, I hope to share what I've learned with all of you. Physics and astronomy are rooted in trying to explain the fundamental forces around us and often inspire someone who studies them to think about big and eternal questions. How did the universe begin? What is it made of and how will it end? Everything we can see, the Earth, you and me, the sun, other stars and galaxies, comprises only 5% of the mass energy density of the universe. What? That's crazy. I'm here telling you that visible matter comprises only 5% of what's out there. Imagine if your professor gave you a textbook and told you the final would cover chapters one through 10 and then ripped out chapters one through nine and told the class, good luck. Wouldn't you be concerned or at least worried about what you missed? I would. Or if your 16th birthday rolls around and your parents give you a car with only 5% of the parts, how are you supposed to get anywhere with only 5%? It's my passion to find out what's in the other 95%. We know dark energy exists, not because we can see it, but because we can measure its effects. Scientists long speculated that the gravitational force of matter would slow cosmic expansion, maybe even reversing it, resulting in a big crunch. As expected, the universe has continued to expand after the Big Bang, but instead of slowing down, it's continued to expand at an ever-accelerating rate. I want you to think about it. There's a big explosion. Matter continues to move away from itself, seemingly forever, theoretically slowing down over time. But that's not what's happening. It's moving away at an ever-accelerating rate. And this is why we need to study dark energy. But before we go any further, we need to travel back to 1929 in an attempt to understand how these questions were raised in the first place. So let's go. In 1929, Edwin Hubble used the best telescopes of the day to observe that the light from distant galaxies was shifted towards the red end of the visible light spectrum due to the Doppler effect. To illustrate this concept in real life, have you ever noticed that the siren on a fire truck sounds different when it's passing by you? Well, if you haven't, it does. As the truck approaches you from the left side, the siren sounds shrill and loud, but changes suddenly as it passes by. As the truck approaches, the distance between the truck emitting sound waves and the person decreases, causing the wavelength to become compressed and thus reaching you with a higher frequency, sounding a higher pitch. As the truck moves by you, the distance between the observer and the source is increasing, creating the wavelength to become stretched out and thus reaching your ear with a lower pitch and a lower frequency. Similarly, redshift of light waves occurs when the space between two celestial bodies is expanding as the light is traveling, and so the wavelength is stretched out. 
This indicates that galaxies are moving further away from Earth and that the universe must be expanding if the light observed from these galaxies is in fact redshifted. This is usually referred to as metric expansion of space, meaning that the galaxies themselves are not actually moving further away, just the space between them is increasing. If we think of the universe as a balloon with drawn on dots that represent galaxies and then expand the balloon so the distance between the dots increases, we can see that the further away the dots are from each other, the faster they move apart. We can also see that the dots themselves are not actually moving, just the space between them is increasing. Hubble's discovery did more than just prove that the universe was expanding. If everything is moving further away, then at some earlier time, the universe must have been smaller than it is right now. If you continue to rewind the cosmological clock, then at some earlier time, the universe must have been very, very small, giving rise to the theory commonly known as the Big Bang. If you ask me, Edwin Hubble did more than enough to deserve getting a telescope named after him. In the 1990s, two independent teams of astronomers attempted to figure out the rate at which the universe was expanding by observing the redshift of supernova, the explosive deaths of stars in distant galaxies. But both teams concluded that the expansion of the universe was not decelerating or static as previously thought, but rather it was accelerating. And normal forces cannot explain accelerating expansion. Think about it. The further things are away from each other, the faster they move apart. Some energy, either electromagnetic or gravitational, must be responsible for that. To explain what these scientists observed and measured, it requires an understanding of what type 1a supernova are and how they're used to measure the expansion of the universe. Type 1a supernova are the thermonuclear explosions of white dwarf stars slightly more massive than our sun. They have a remarkably bright and consistent peak luminosity, about 4 billion times that of the sun. Since white dwarf stars are so dense, their gravitational pull is exceptionally strong. And since they're often in a binary star system with another star, they begin to pull the outer layers off of its companion, continually adding matter to itself. As you can see, as the, type 1, as the white dwarf star reaches a mass of 1.4 solar masses, a nuclear reaction occurs, causing the star to explode. This chain reaction always happens in the same way, and therefore the brightness of the type 1a supernova is always consistent. To find the distance to the supernova, scientists compare its intrinsic luminosity, as if you were standing next to it, to the apparent brightness observed from Earth. Using type 1a supernova as standard candles, we can find the redshifts and prove that the universe is in fact expanding. At this moment, Astrophysicists realized they were encountering something they did not have the framework nor theory to explain. A dark, repulsive energy that counteracts the force of gravity, but does not emit any electromagnetic radiation and therefore cannot be directly seen, is a plausible explanation for universal accelerating expansion. In the seconds following the Big Bang, when the overall temperature of the universe reached up to 1 billion degrees Kelvin, the slight inhomogeneous differences in temperature left background radiation that's seen in composite images of what we call the cosmic microwave background, or the CMB. When the universe was a mere 400,000 years old, it generated background radiation left over from particles forming from protons and neutrons that separated from photons of light in a process called decoupling. The primordial radiation left over from this is seen with almost complete uniformity across the universe. NASA surveyed the sky with the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite and was able to map the temperature and background radiation left over from the early stages of the universe. The CMB represents the edge of the visible universe, and when we look out, we find slight fluctuations that correlate to the distribution of matter in the universe today, represented by the red and blue spots. The blue spots, or the cool regions, are regions of overdensity, whereas the red or hotter regions are regions of underdensity, all of which show the imperfection and departures from true uniformity across the universe. All of these imperfections become important because they're necessary to form large-scale structures like stars and galaxy clusters. Astronomers use the CMB by showing the original CMB fluctuations and comparing that to the distribution of matter at both the present day and in the past. By doing this, scientists can find the rate at which the universe is expanding at an ever-accelerating rate. 
Let's quickly debrief. Almost 90 years ago, thanks to Edwin Hubble, it was proved that the universe was expanding by observing the redshift of distant galaxies. 60 years later, teams of astronomers proved, through observing type 1a supernova and the cosmic microwave background radiation, that not only was the universe expanding, but expanding at an ever-accelerating rate, which can be observed and measured. Searching for answers amidst so much unknown is the core of the problem facing astrophysicists today. The answer to our question may lie on the smallest of scales, known as quantum mechanics, which theoretically allow energy and matter to appear seemingly out of nowhere, only for brief instances. Some think that dark energy is a new, fundamental force in the universe, which is only realized when the universe reaches the present size, and thus only discoverable in recent years. Or, to quote Hubble's site, Perhaps the answer lies within another long-standing unsolved problem. How to reconcile the physics of the very large with the physics of the very small? Einstein's theory of general relativity is able to predict the motions of planets and the physics of black holes, but seems not to apply on the quantum or atomic level. Similarly, to predict the motions of particles, particle physicists use the theory of quantum mechanics, but this fails to predict the motion of anything larger than an atom. Perhaps, a combination of these two elusive theories might result in a natural explanation for dark energy. But we may never fully understand the peculiarity of dark energy, but to me, the search for answers is both thrilling and worthwhile. I truly believe that we can never understand the problems facing the world today or understand the significance and impact of our own lives without putting it into the broader context of the universe as a whole. And cliche as it sounds, whether you, whether you all remember the contents of this talk or not, I hope the core message stays with you. I implore you to continue to seek out knowledge and push the frontiers of human understanding by being continually curious and venturing into the unknown, always striving to find the truth. Thank you.